All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, first of all, uh, welcome to the uh, our, our first uh, virtual member meeting. Um, I'm Brandon Koalis. I'm the uh, the higher ed representative. And Camille, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Camille Hogue. I'm the public ed chair. OK, so we've got some uh, got some great stuff for you all today. Um, we're going to this morning. So we have two sessions. Uh, this morning's session is going to go from 10.30 to 11.30, and then our afternoon session will be going from, uh, from 1.30 to 2.30. Uh, this morning, we're going to be listening to, uh, to Nathan Auk and Sid Grua from the state offices. And uh, But before we turn the time over to them, um, I just uh, wanted to go over a couple of, uh, of logistics for the meeting, and, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So... The first thing I'm going to post here on the chat. Let's see if I can get to it. Uh, my mouse just disappeared. Oh, sorry. <laughs> nice. Okay, well, I'll just go over it and then I'll post it as soon as my computer stops wigging out. The joys of technology, right? Okay, so. First of all, if you haven't completed the breakout session form that was sent out last week uh, via the listserv, I'm gonna go ahead and post a link here in just a minute. And uh, so that all of you who haven't done that can enter your name and email address and whether you're associated with higher ed or with public ed. And we'll use that to sort of preload the breakout sessions and that way we can just switch to them really easily. So I will be posting that link here in just a minute. Uh, also, if you have, any questions or comments as we go along? We've got a lot of people in this meeting. So in order to maintain some order and not have, you know, like five people speaking at once, if you could either type your question or your comment in the chat, we'll be monitoring that. Or you can just use the little raise hand feature, which is under the, there should be like a reactions button uh, there in Zoom. You click on that and there's a little raise hand. Your hand will pop up and then we'll call on you and then you can unmute yourself and ask that question. So that will uh, ensure that we don't have, you know, multiple people talking at once. And then the last thing that I'll mention, because this question frequently comes up, are we going to be recording the meeting? Yes, we are recording this meeting. And uh, after it's done, we'll post it to the UASEP website. Uh, this afternoon, um, we will uh, we'll sort of go into detail on that. But let me also, uh, before we jump in and turn the time over to, to Nathan and Sid, uh, let me just walk through sort of the agenda for today. So this was sent out via the listserv, but this morning, um, so we got, of course, our welcome and, and overview. Uh, at about 1040, we're going to turn the time over to Sid and Nathan. They're going to go over some legislative updates, which luckily this year hasn't been a super hot session when it comes to concurrent enrollment. So that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, next, I'll talk about the UCI scholarships that are replacing Regents in New Century. Uh, we'll go through CE grades and grading, how that works. And then, uh, and then Nathan will talk about the early college dashboard and the reporting and application. So that'll be this morning's session. Uh, in the afternoon, we are uh, gonna have some business items that we need to cover. First of all, we're gonna give the uh, committees, uh, the different NASEP committees that were formed at the last NASEP meeting. I uh, remember we redid our bylaws and we created a couple of new uh, committee positions. So those committees are gonna give some updates as, what they're, as to what they've been working on and um, what's coming down the road in the future. I will also talk about some ad hoc projects and do a little call for managers. We'll go over some projects that, uh, that after we did a survey, uh, people seemed interested in pursuing those sort of projects. So we'll talk about those. Uh, we'll go over a couple of bylaw updates that were made. And then we'll talk about uh, the secretary search. We need a secretary. So uh, you can think about, uh, we sent out an email that showed the, uh, a list of the sort of the job responsibilities of the secretary. It's pretty minimal, pretty, pretty simple. 
Um, think about if you would like to nominate someone or if you'd like to nominate yourself. So we'll be talking about that later uh, this afternoon. And then after that, we'll go into higher ed and public ed breakouts. So we'll have about 15 minutes for those, uh, just for higher ed folks to bring up any, uh, any cool things they wanna share, any questions, any pressing issues they wanna discuss. Uh, same with public ed as well. Uh, anything that you all want to discuss uh, or things that you wanna share with each other. So that is uh, sort of the morning, the afternoon uh, agenda for the meeting today. Should be fun and exciting. We've got lots of things in the works. Hopefully uh, over the last uh, few months and continuing forward, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be able to, uh, to, to continue to grow as an organization. Like I said, we got lots of things in the works and some new ideas for adding value to concurrent enrollment practitioners across the state. So stay tuned. Hopefully you'll stick with us for the afternoon. We got some great stuff for you both uh, this morning and this afternoon. And with that, I'm gonna turn the time over to Nathan and Sid to give us some updates from the state level and talk about some things that we ought to know. So uh, Nathan said the time is yours and you should have the ability to share your screen if you've got a presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if I can here. Yes, we have a presentation. And yes, Nathan forced me to use Google Docs. I'm old, you people. Can't do that too long. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to give you an update. Uh, um, we're going to go to add one little thing on the very beginning of our presentation. Uh, and that is something that we would have shared with you on slide two if we had met in the fall with, with, when we were distracted with COVID. And that is just a brief snippet of our annual update. Um, in 19, uh, 2019 20, uh, the concurrent <clears throat> program in the state served 43,000, almost 43,000 students. They earned 323,000 semester credits and saved $62.7 million in the process. This is a phenomenal opportunity for students and their families. And the significance about those numbers is um, it's an 11.4% growth over the previous year. I think we had about 38,000 students then. Um, there is a beautiful one page official annual report with logos and seals and all kinds of information. You can find it on utahce.org if you care to, to look at more. I'd like to highlight one thing um, specifically about our growth in 1920 and math. Um, in 2015 general session, um, legislation was passed to encourage students to finish math while they were in high school and to use concurrent enrollment to do it. We call it Senate Bill 196. And y'all know that math is a barrier for kids completing, completing college. And if you don't take math senior year, and then for a lot of kids in Utah, you go on a church uh, volunteer mission, uh, you have a three-year gap and you're really rusty. And then trying to finish that QL is a huge, huge barrier. This last year, we had 38,500 earned credits in QL. That's about somewhere between 12,200 and 13,000 kids finished their QL requirement for college graduation through the concurrent program. And that significance is if you look at the little chart, 15, 16, you've doubled the number of kids who've earned credit through concurrent enrollment in a matter of five years. Next slide shows you one thing else that's also very interesting. When we started this in 2015, 92% of that earned credit in that first little circle was in Math 1050, College Algebra. And 1050 is the class you have to take if in fact you're gonna go study something in college that requires you to go on to calculus. Um, I, I don't know, I wish I did, I don't know the percentage of students that go into our colleges and universities and study STEM or, or go into a field that requires calculus, but I would argue that it's not 92%. Um, this last year, and absolutely the 18, 19 numbers are exactly the same. We've gotten to this point where about, about a little short of 60% of the earned credits in that QL instead of 92, and the rest is divided between statistics and quantitative literacy. For a student who's not going to go into a STEM field and for whom they just don't have a, an acumen for math, to be able to encourage them to take one of those other two QL courses is, 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 is removing a huge barrier for them. And that's something we all should be very, very proud of. Um, I'm wondering when we're gonna saturate the math market in concurrent enrollment, but it seems like there's still room for growth. 
And I'll turn the time over to Nathan to talk about the, the scant things we're covering in the legislative session. Yeah, and before we leave this math conversation, uh, thanks for, for sharing that, that data, Sid. Um, just from uh, a kind of a look to the future about <laughs> what these math pathways look like, uh, we are ahead of the game in the higher ed world within mathematics in having 1030, 1040, and 1050 kind of um, correlated with different majors uh, that yes. require that type of QL credit. A lot of states don't have that pathway system in place. And so we continue to have uh, experiences where students get to college, have to take retake math courses or take remedial courses in order to get to that QL space. And so the future uh, of the, the kind of high school pathways conversation is a bright one. In the next couple of years, we hope to be able to line up pathways in the secondary math world to uh, kind of align with these 1030, 1040, and 1050 classes so that we can ensure that no student has a terminating math experience uh, that leads them unable to get that QL credit once they get to, to college, as well as um, being prepared to be a kind of effective citizen uh, with the math content that they get within the high school space. <clears throat> Thank you. So, um, so jumping into this legislative session, as Brandon mentioned, uh, I, I feel a similar uh, amount of gratitude and, and, and fortune that we didn't have more kind of focus this year. Last year, there was uh, lots of things kind of coming out every week. Uh, and this year, the, the changes that we see are, are reasonably um, minimal to, to the entire system. Uh, there are a few bills that, that make big differences within aspects of our our system related to concurrent enrollment. Uh, the first one is SB1. So uh, this is just relating to the funding for concurrent enrollment. As you may remember last general session, uh, we had uh, roughly $5 million extra dollars allocated to the concurrent enrollment um, state funds. And unfortunately, that, that money was then rescinded during the special session as uh, the pandemic hit and uh, people were scrambling, not knowing what, what the future held. And so um, though we weren't uh, confident this uh, going into this session, USB brought a business case uh, connected to increasing the funds back to that, um, that level that was passed during the general session last year. Uh, we did not see, uh, we are at this point, PEA, the Public Ed Appropriations Committee, nor the Executive Appropriations Committee have included that money on their budgets. And so it is almost um, guaranteed that we won't see those funds during this uh, next fiscal year. The, the, um, the kind of complement to that, though, is LEAs across the state and uh, the higher ed world are, are, are seeing pretty remarkable one-time funding amounts that are coming out of both CARES money as well as um, state funds that are ultimately discretionary for the LEA um, and can be used to kind of fill some of the gaps that exist within uh, our concurrent enrollment ecosystem. As you may have heard Sid or I talk about previously, the um, per credit funding uh, amounts across the state right now are at historic lows. Uh, they're just under $40 per credit. Whereas in the past, we've consistently had $50 or, or, or more. It, it usually hovered around 50 15. in 15, 16. But that explosive growth that you saw in the, the graph previously has made um, this a kind of untenable situation for LEAs. So I, I just want everyone to know that <laughs> um, coming out of this session, uh, ongoing funds this year were hard to come by. Um, again, March 5th is the end of the session, so anything could happen. But, but with what the Executive uh, Appropriations Committee has funded currently, ongoing funds were just really challenging to come by this year because there were so many one-time funds out there. So know that we'll continue to advocate for these, mon these monies and, and hopefully be able to, to get um, the funding levels back to a kind of tenable place in the future at some point. We know that there's appetite for it. The legislature um, unanimously passed uh, out of both committees and um, the House and the Senate last year, these uh, suggestions for funding to concurrent enrollment. Uh, and so we're hopeful in the future that we'll be able to secure uh, additional uh, funds on top of, of, of that. The, the positive part about what came from last year was that the language related to the growth formula changing uh, did <laughs> um, stay in code when the, the funding was removed. And so we saw a, an increase in the percentage of uh, growth money that we got this year as compared to last year. Although Sid and I 
when we put our heads together, we can't exactly figure out where this $857,000 calculation came from. Yeah. It is higher than the percentages that have been applied previously, but the way that we understand the formula, um, it's not applied uh, verbatim there. So uh, when, when we figure it out, we'll, we'll make sure we communicate with the community. Uh, so if you wanna talk about that uh, or anything else connected to that, feel free, and then you can move on to the, the other um, statutory changes. Well, I do think it's too bad that we didn't get the, the significant bump in the base, but the fact that they changed the formula is is really huge. We had an 11.24% growth, and the old formula looked at the K-12 population, and their growth has been below 2% for five years. So just putting the growth formula in place, even though we don't understand exactly what the flip they did to come up with 857, 600, um, is a huge difference. Usually these bumps in um, in growth are like, three to five thousand three to five hundred thou so so we're grateful for that that's there and and everyone get vaccinated let's get rid of the pandemic and we'll come back at it next year that's all i have to say thank you so much so do you want to talk about uh dixie oh. state Okay. All right. Let's not show a show of hands. Nathan listened to more of this than I did, and some of my bosses did. But um, I, I bet 25 cents with one of my bosses that this this name change bill, Willer, will not get out of committee, and Willer will not get to the to the finish line by Friday. Is it Friday or Thursday that we end? Whatever the the session ends. Friday. Um, I'm just we're just pointing this out because Dixie State is an institution that provides concurrent enrollment to to Kane and Washington school districts. But um, uh, what the name would change to, and and the process that they go through, they have to provide a name idea by next by next fall. Who knows what's going to happen with that? You can you've heard people students protesting for and people protesting against a name change. It, yeah, it was really interesting to listen to the House and Senate uh, committee hearings on this. They were long. <laughs> there was a lot of public comment, um, and almost no one commented on the bill. Like the bill establishes a process for name change, but everyone just wanted to talk about the name change itself. So um, it was interesting to listen to. Listen to. Uh, I'm sure you'll all be excited to go back and listen to those committee hearings. They're available on le.gov. <laughs> um, so next up, we have HB 279. This is a, a very kind of targeted bill for um, providing higher education experiences for incarcerated youth, both in the concurrent enrollment space as well as the adult ed space. Um, I don't know. Is Kevin Simmons here? Um, he could. I don't think he is. Okay, I'll speak to it briefly. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. If I don't know the answers, I'm happy to um, find them. But but ultimately, this establishes uh, both a funding source and a delivery program for students that are incarcerated, being able to uh, take higher ed coursework um, and 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 kind of matriculate through. Uh, both content and uh, kind of graduation levels while still incarcerated. This, this would affect um, up to 100 uh, youth potentially. So it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonably small part of the community, but a really important part of the community, especially as it relates to um, being like having a place within uh, society and a pathway to continue to, to continuing to be a kind of um, service of like a, a contributing member of society once they get out of um, those circumstances. So it's administered uh, at Dixie State and um, would be kind of a remote setting for students across uh, the, the incarcerated youth programs that are, are dotted um, across the state. So if anyone has any other questions about that, um, feel free to shoot them our way uh, and we'll get you the answers if we don't have them um, ourselves. So, was, oh, go ahead. It was interesting to me to look at this bill yesterday and see there were 21 representatives that signed on as co-sponsors of this bill so and they had lots to say about the Dixie name change and they wanted their name associated with this initiative and it's not I don't understand it you probably understand better than I do and it's probably not important but there's different types of incarcerated youth this is one type of person is going to be incarcerated long enough that he she can finish a concurrent course and um and more power and there's special things that they have to do you can't you know how they deliver the curriculum and how students have access to computers to do the work etc is going to have to have special consideration it's also the case kevin are you here he's not here 
But in talking to Kevin Simmons about this, the CE director, Janet Dixie, he has a history working with these populations I didn't know about before he went to work for Washington School District. And so I think he is uh, uniquely positioned to be able to understand some of the and anticipate some of the pitfalls and some of the necessary things to serve this population. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Um, so if there's no other questions uh, about two, HB 279, um, Sid, do we have someone specific that's going to talk about SB 136? No. Okay. <laughs> I have the next slide. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Go for it. Um, this, uh, you, uh, this opportunity, it's called the Opportunity Scholarship now. Um, we were calling it the Yushi Scholarship for whatever. We are replacing the Region Scholarship and the New Century Scholarship with, with a thing called the Opportunity Scholarship, which in fact concurrent enrollment factors into. And I'm oversimplifying this because I'm not a scholarship person. I understand the concurrent enrollment implications. And that is that the eligibility criteria for this scholarship are completion of one language arts course, one math course, and one science course where co college credit was earned. And that can be done through AP or IB or concurrent enrollment. Um, we. In talking to the concurrent directors about this in December and again in February, um, the little chart I have here is a chart of the earned credit in 2019-20 uh, of language arts, math, and science courses across the system. And the different colors, really, you need to offer one of each course. You don't have to have multiples, but you need to offer one of each course. And any student who wants to work on this scholarship needs to hopefully will have the opportunity to enroll in that course. We had one district across the entire state that one in, uh, in the 1920 year did not offer a concurrent enrollment science course. Now, I'm only looking at concurrent enrollment. Um, that th those districts could offer AP, they could offer IB. So it's, it's, this is not a complete picture. But our goal in concurrent enrollment land can be to say, uh, have a conversation between the LEA partners and the institutions about language arts, math, and science courses. Is there anything that's problematic that's, that, 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 that stands in the way of having certain students within your purview not be able to take these three classes through concurrent? Um, is there anything that an LEA wishes that an institution would would work with them to offer? Uh, is there any, you know, things that an institution can say to an LEA? This would be have to be the conditions for you to have more of these courses. Ideally, you'd have two or three of each one of those, so students have choices. But you need to have one of each, and that's that is um, the goal coming out of higher education. Um, comments or questions about this this concurrent enrollment implication for the Opportunity Scholarship. And, and Sid, if I can just add a couple of things uh, from the, the public ed side. Um, we've had a remarkable uh, amount of challenge as it relates to uh, the flexibility with how Regents uh, and New Century to a lesser extent um, has been applied in the past. Uh, and so the, the feedback that I've gotten on this shift is that um, folks in the public ed space are, are really appreciative that um, Yushi reacted to, to those challenges that, that largely resulted from a, a kind of prescriptive course list. Uh, and so the flexibility that comes from having a course you earn college credit in within these, these big bins, um, LEAs have been really receptive of and to. And, um, and so in addition to those, there's only one other uh, expectation. Well, I guess there's two other ex expectations is to have uh, a FAFSA completed, as well as have a 3.3 GPA. Three GPA, yes. Yeah. 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 So um, from what I've heard uh, in the public ed space, people are really uh, appreciative and excited about the flexibility that'll come from uh, this this shift. It's an easier um, it's easier to explain the eligibility criteria to students and their parents. It's simple. OK, and I think that I heard that in one of your early college meetings. So they said sometimes advisors or counselors, you know, if they don't know all the details, they don't want to talk about a scholarship. Well, this is simple. A 3.3, finish the FAFSA and earn credit in each one of these three classes. Um, how, one of the questions in the um, chat is how are we going to communicate this to parents and students? Um, 
you know, um, uh, Nathan, uh, uh, Jolie Honey and then and now Lindsay um, Henderson created this infographic for math and how to pick the right QL for your child. And um, that's posted uh, on utahce.org and it's posted in the CE director's box. And that particular document has gotten a lot of traction. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe if we created a similar one page document, and when I say we, it's probably not me, it's folks in my office who are like the experts at communication that say, here's what's required and, and, and write it in terms that is available and post it on utahce.org. I'm hoping that's one thing that can be used. We will post the presentation, yes, um, on utahce.org. And then do, do students have to pass the AP exam with a certain score, Tracy asks. Do you know that, Nathan? I don't think I know. So the answer is generally yes. <laughs> they have to, um, have to have earned credit. Yeah, so it's a little it's a little trickier than a certain score because um, there are different uh, credit bearing circumstances for different uh, exams. And that goes in the AP space as well as the IB space. So um, I haven't heard uh, Yushi kind of identify what that might look like. Traditionally, both within board rule and statute, um, what, what we see is a three, a, a score of three on an AP exam or a score of four on an IB exam would, uh, is, is the, <laughs> the average score that allows you to earn credit from, from those circumstances. Though I know that that is not uniform across uh, IHEs across the state. It's more uniform and it's getting there. Starting a, a year ago, as a matter of fact, College Board came out and spoke with what we call the majors committees. And they talked about norming the awards across the system. Because we have, you know, for the most part, we were relatively awarding the same credit, but there's places where, Institution A was awarding something different than Institution B. And so that effort continues, uh, uh, but I think it'll make life easier for all of us. So I'm hearing that we need to develop some sort of a one page infographic like the successful math one that identifies the criteria and answers the question, do you have to earn credit on the AP exam? Jill Landis Lee also asked, what's the amount for this scholarship? I don't think anyone has a clue at, at that because you have to take the dollar amount the legislature gives you and you have to divide it by the number of people that apply. Uh, and so um, I won't touch that with a 10 foot pole, but I'll bring it back to the commissioners and say, can you give, are there some guardrails or parameters you could provide? And then Heidi Foster asks, um, oh, an eligible institution may award a scholarship for an amount of money up to 238 do you mean percent? The total cost. I can't answer Heidi's question on the fly. Um, and Christine asked the question: Does the course need to be the CE course need to be a course that has a core flag on the master list? Some of the CE courses available count for higher education, but may not count as a high school core. Non-lab based science courses are elective courses, not core courses. And my understanding, Nathan, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you earn science credit in college. And so a non-lab based science course would be acceptable. Do you, do you have a different take on that? Um, I guess we haven't had a conversation about it yet. Um, the, the memo that uh, Melanie and Spencer sent to me said a concurrent enrollment course. Um, I don't have strong opinions like immediately with <laughs> whether non-concurrent enrollment, higher education earning credit would apply. Like I, I feel pretty comfortable with that um as a first blush but but i would love to to dig into that a, a little more deeply <laughs> yeah um i really appreciate your questions uh continue to post questions and if you have additional questions about the eligibility criteria do it i can bring that back to spencer jenkins and 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 the people in our office and make sure that those questions are answered when we produce an informational piece for you yeah, so I, I have heard Spencer talk about this being stackable in, in circumstances in which Regents was not. Um, I know that this, uh, the top end uh, of this is kind of affected by uh, how much money you qualify from a, um, a need-based uh, circumstance. Right. And so if you qualify for grants in, um, for Utah Promise or like uh, other grants within FAFSA that are need-based, um, that this amount of money will be scaled 
to fit uh, full tuition. Um, whereas in, in Regent's case, um, as many of you are, are probably familiar, you could use the excess money on Regents to, to pay for uh, you know, all, all, all of the things, even beyond tuition, you, you, you could even, a lot of students were using it for housing and, and materials um, and living expenses, et cetera. So- Carmen, Carmen asked another good question. And that is if you're a senior and take the AP, will that count because an AP score is not reported to you until after um, you know, you've graduated and you're on your way to college? Um, again, I keep on posting questions because I don't have an answer on that one, but I'm going to post that to my, my bosses so that we can make sure they answer it correctly. As you know, with some of the things we do, like with concurrent enrollment, you must have earned the credit by the time your class graduated from high school. Well, if you take a class, uh, take an exam in what, May or April, and you took the exam while you were a senior, but the grade isn't reported, I have to find out how they handle that. Um, I think when you, they, everyone was really excited about the opportunity scholarship, now we're getting down to the nitty gritty weeds and we need to make sure we work them out. Um, uh, my answer about the money is yes, it tells you how much money, but the significant point is up to. If you have 10 people apply versus 10,000, it's going to make a difference in how they can divide up the, the amounts. I think one of the intents of this opportunity scholarship was to find ways to focus more on um, a need-based um, uh, a need-based student, which somehow hadn't happened in the same way with the two other state scholarships we used to have. And if I'm correct, there is a date for sunsetting new century scholarship students. And I think if I'm correct, after July 1st, no one can start that program. But I'll get that worked out and I'll put that in this informational piece. Yeah, I know there was an amendment um, to the legislation surrounding this scholarship about the sunsetting date of regents. And I think it was moved from the spring to the, the fall. Yes. Yeah, that's my, my understanding. So uh, there's also a question here about uh, does the scholarship speak to US citizenship? Um, it does not. And FAFSA being a requirement for it um, could like create a circumstance in which citizenship comes into to play. Um, I, I don't have more beyond that. I haven't been a part of conversations that have touched and, that. And it's a really good question for undocumented yeah, yeah. students. Brandon, I'm gonna ask a stupid Zoom question. All the chat is captured, right? So I don't have to write this down furiously. That's right, it is. Okay, good. Um, keep on typing things into chat. I way appreciate it. And um, it, this will be my responsibility. I will take it back to the commissioner's office and say, here's things that came up. Can you do a Q&A? And uh, people want to know. <laughs> so anything else? It says that the last day uh, for new century applications is August 15th, 2021. So it's the end of, end of the summer. All right, shall we move on to grades? I have to put a shout out to Jill Landisley for persisting in, in saying to me there was a problem with concurrent grades. And she actually identified a possible source of this issue. And it was my fault because I think I wrote the language. Um, what we know is that across the system, across the eight institutions and all of our partners in public ed, um, there are different ways that LEAs are recording and reporting grades. And, um, and I, I had the opportunity to have some phone calls with a couple of districts and say, how do, you, how do you report grades on your transcripts? What do your transcripts look like? One of the things I learned, for example, is that there is no one way that all high schools in the state of Utah transcript grades. Uh, most of them will transcript one grade per term and that grade per term represents the performance that they did in that term. Some of them actually, and to me, this is the, the, cat, the cool Cadillac, some of them actually post term grades and then also a cumulative grade for the semester or for the year, depending upon how long the class was. Used to be the case that there were a few that actually, if it was a con were a concurrent course, 
they wouldn't post a term grade. They posted some sort of a placeholder saying they're in a concurrent course. You have to wait till the end. And I suspect that practice curled the toes of many, many parents across the state. But this thing, these two sentences are kind of contradictory because one is it says if, if you're posting concurrent grades to a high school transcript, that grade represents what they did in that term. And then the second sentence says the final course grade posted on the high school transcript and the college transcript must be the same. No, it must be what they did in that term. And we had some districts that actually were changing the final grade to match the college grade. Because one thing that is for sure is in college, there's one grade transcripted per course, whether that's a semester long course or a year long course, we transcript one grade. And so we talked amongst ourselves and the next slide reflects um, the language that we would like, we will put in to next year's handbook, but looking for comments from um, folks on this meeting. Same sentence, same first sentence, the CE term grades recorded on a high school transcript reflects students' performance for that term. The final course grade reported by, recorded by the institution on a permanent college or university transcript is the cumulative grade across all terms. And just for fun, on the next slide, I put an example just to make sure that we were all on the same page. Here's my four term grades. These are the grades I got for four terms. These are my performance. I got spring fever, fall uh, spring term. I didn't do as well, they'll end. I take those four grades, I divide it by four and my cumulative grade is a 2.85, which is a B plus. Now it is possible, okay, that with some latitude, if a 2.7 is a B plus and I got a 2.85, it's possible that a teacher might assign a B, an A minus to that course. I mean, that's between your, your adjunct to your, and your institution, et cetera. But the bottom line is, let's assume that 2.85 is a B plus. The institution is going to record a B plus on their transcript. So there'll be four term grades on the high school. There'll be one term grade on the college or university transcript. Comments or questions about that response to that? I have a question. This is Beth Rhodes. Yes. So if you are transitioning to this model, is the are the is the requirement still in place that the the high school grade and the university grade may must match or are we doing away with that? Well, I, I hate grades, Beth. Um, um, the whole issue of grades came up 10, 12 years ago when legislative analysts said uh, they used the term equivalent credit, same credit value. Or uh, there's, a, there's a term they use that's not a term that we use for talking about grades. And they say they have to have the same credit value. And uh, I was there and they were doing audits and I understand what's going on. The bottom line is I think this is what you should have been doing all along. High schools are, I mean, I don't know, I don't know about Weber Ogden, Davis Morgan, but I think the idea that a high school is not going to put a grade uh, for a concurrent, a year long concurrent course, they're not going to put a grade in term one, two, three, and four until grade four is just not possible. If I were a parent, I'd be freaking out about what my student was doing. And so are there any people on the call where you do that on your high school transcript? You do not record a grade until term four for a four Jordan year does. concurrent? Jordan School does? District does. Jordan School District oh. does. And, par and parents do not freak out because they can see daily progress on our Skyward grading system. They can see every assignment, quiz. And so we have uh, midterms, term reviews, where the teacher and you know parent-teacher conferences, where they talk about upcoming assignments and where the student's progress is at. So we have formative check-ins and, and reporting through our grading. And, and, and we do that with semester classes as well. So our grade is exactly the grade they see on the college. We were having uh, just historically, some of the issues that come up is you will have a student pass term one and then fail the class. And so the, the records do not match, they don't align because there's actually no credit earned from the college transcript where then there's some type of credit earned for a, a term. And this is just much cleaner 
our parents don't freak out because they they can see it moving all along and then we post at the very end of the class and we just we've been doing this for probably since the last you know six years i am so grateful to hear it and i'm so grateful i'm hearing it from one of the larger districts in the state um Jordan's model is the Cadillac. To me, that's the way to do it. One grade on the high school transcript, one grade on the college transcript. But are there other districts that could you change to that? Or are there other districts that say, heck, will freeze over? Well, that's not my question. My question, I thought, was, isn't a grade match a determination for funding? Uh, yes, but to me, this is this example on the slide is a grade match. But the grades don't match. If you're going to go, if you're going to go apples to apples, there's nowhere in your whole high school grade system that in this example that says my final grade is a B plus and my final grade at the university is a B plus. So that must mean my grades match. Um, you can't, Kristen Campbell, when she does our matching for, for enrollment, she's not looking at one grade. She's for the most part looking at four grades. I mean- Okay, that's great. I, I didn't know that. No, I know, I know. I mean, it's, Jill had to clarify this for me because I mean, I had to go back, back and look at my children's GPAs or their transcripts because in my high school in New Jersey, back in however many years, I will not admit that I graduated from high school, my high school transcript rep had one grade per class. Okay. So halfway across the country. That's the way we did it. But my children's grades, their final, final transcript from Salt Lake School District has four grades for every class they took, or you know, two, depending upon year long or half a year long. So, so so Kristen can't do a a, a solid, solid match if she doesn't have one grade from the institution. She can do it for Jordan School District. She couldn't do it for anyone else because they're reporting four grades. So, so Sid, I have a question. Uh, Camille Hope from Davis School District. Yes. So our district is um, asking our teachers to basically roll a grade. So they take what they got from first term and they roll it into second term. So if it's a semester class, then the second term grade is the it's, same grade as what they turn in to the university. If it's a year long class, they roll right. the grades over so that by its fourth term, it's a cumulative grade of the whole year. And that's what gets, so that matches with what's submitted to the university. And I'm pretty sure that's what um, Granite School District um, said. Sandy said that they did in Granite School District also. I mean, I uncovered seven different ways that um, high schools are reporting concurrent grades. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's, I don't know, I, yeah. That's okay too. Jordan's way of doing it's the Cadillac, uh, but I think that uh, I don't know about uh, Davis's way doesn't meet our definition. Not this new one, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just speaking out of Beth's service area, um, how is uh, I think I saw Christine on the line, and I don't know about Weber and Mer Morgan. Do you know, Christine, are you there? Do you know how you do it in Ogden School District? Yes. So, so we've always operated under the assumption that the final grade in the class has to equal the, the Weber State grade. And so if it's a year long class like History 1700, they, they get a first quarter grade and then that grade is put into second terms grade and they continue earning and then that grade is put into the next terms grade. So at any given time, a teacher, <clears throat> a student, a parent can look and know exactly what the student's getting. So there's none of this, oh, I got an A first term and an F second term, I got a C. They, it just is a continuation of the grade. So then whatever they get fourth quarter, if it's a year long or second quarter, if it's a semester, is the grade that is recorded on Weber State's transcript. And I've been doing this for about 11 years and I think we've operated under that. Um, way of doing things for at least eight or nine years. So yeah, the thing we have two in Davis. Okay, this to me, that works. But what I'm hearing also is we have instances where 
a district is giving a term one grade for term one performance, a term two grade for term three two performance, three for three, and four, they give a cumulative grade. And that is not illustrative of the student's performance in the class. You know, it's not, it's right. not, because it doesn't show what they did fourth term. Um, right. And we used to do that that way when I very first was a concurrent enrollment teacher. But even before I left, I used to teach nutrition 1020 and I always rolled the grade all the way through so that anytime a parent looked on SIS, that is what the kid was getting at that time. That's what they were going to get in the class at the end. Okay. This is what I'm going to say. One, I wish I knew what all 41 districts and 37 charter schools were doing. Okay. <laughs> And maybe with the help of Brandon, we could do some sort of a poll. Um, and um, the language hasn't changed yet, but we have, I've, we've identified things that don't work. And what doesn't work is to award a term grade three times and then do something different to the fourth grade. And that was what, I mean, I think that's what I was talking to Sandy Hammered about and granted it was she was concerned about how to do that. So I need to, find out what you all are doing and maybe we have to rewrite the language to say here's a practice that doesn't work here's a practice that does work but Beth there's not one way that it's being done across the state and when that's the case it's kind of like it makes it difficult for us to administer you know, things like the match oh and I understand that I just wanted to be clear that if if that match is still what is determining funding then the conversation needs to continue because that's what we clearly communicate to our de our department on campuses grades are matching because it's it's determining funding so well to be specific keep on saying that because i think it's important but funding is 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 determined whether a, based on whether the student earned credit or didn't earn credit slightly different slightly different so you got a w and erf or you've got something else but I wouldn't and, go into that detail. And, and I get that, but it's also a, a quality check on our Absolutely. end. Our, our departments feel much more comfortable knowing that grades are matching at the end and that that's just kind of the way that it is. And so I, I understand, but I just wanted to be clear that I, I feel like a little bit more conversation can be had. I really appreciate this conversation. We need to turn the time over to, uh, to Nathan to finish talking about uh, giving his USBE update. But um, needed to have more input from folks. I'm going to talk to Brandon and see how widespread a survey I can get. And then I will take all your comments in the chat and try and retool language that maybe points to what is not acceptable versus the three ways that are acceptable. So let me, I'm, I'll back to the drawing table and that's why we had this conversation. Darn, but I really appreciate the input. Thank you. And let's move on for, um, Nathan, sorry. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for the conversation. Um, and like, I, I'm just always appreciative of how uh, insightful the comments that that come up within these circumstances are. I know we had uh, a, a pretty broad conversation about uh, grading policies during our last USEP in person meeting. Whenever that happened, it feels like a lifetime ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, just like keep those comments coming. We're we're really appreciative of them. So uh, I want to talk about a, a few things that are coming up within a, the kind of public ed purview. And um, the first thing that I wanted to point out, and this also applies to, to higher ed and UCHI, but um, more and more our uh, board at the Utah State Board of Education is putting this kind of early college ecosystem at the center of the, the metrics that it uses to define like efficacy within public ed in general. It is one of only eight metrics that we use, uh, the, the frequency of college, what, what this report calls uh, college readiness coursework or early college coursework. Um, it's, all, it's one of only eight metrics that the strategic plan lays out for uh, efficacy of education across the state. Um, and obviously there's a lot of initiatives that are, that are beyond those things, but, but I think it says a lot that in 2021, um, it, like this ecosystem has been elevated to that level of importance. Um, that it's one of the eight most important metrics that USBE looks at. And so um, the, this, ed, like, uh, you, <laughs> this comes from our strategic plan and the metrics, the education elevated targets are these things that I was just talking about. In a, a report that was just released uh, last week, 
um, publicly, we saw where we were at in this process of um, between the data that was pulled in 2015-16 versus 2022. Um, the goal was to cut uh, the gaps um, in student taking college readiness coursework between the 15-16 levels and 100% uh, by a third. And, and that's what that yellow line on this slide represents. The 2022 target is that 86% of all students will graduate high school with at least a half a credit of um, college, uh, a half a college credit from APIB uh, or concurrent enrollment experiences. And so this data is not only um, aggregate, you can see the all students uh, blue bar at the right. We're not quite at that 86%, but we're really close. In fact, we're closer in this metric than any other metric that the USB uh, looks at, like comparing graduation rates, um, math, language, arts, and science uh, standardized test performance. We're, we're the closest to being on track uh, to reach that goal of all of those metrics. However, as you'll notice, when we break out this data by um, student group, that there are a number of underrepresented student groups that are far behind uh, the levels that all students are, or their um, the, the overrepresented student group compares with that group. So in English proficiency, you can see English learners on the left at 63% of graduates had at least half a credit of, of college coursework earned, whereas non-English learners over almost 86%. And so these gaps in participation have become a focus for um, our kind of early college community over the last couple of years, as I'm sure everyone um, on the call is aware of. And we see similar uh, circumstances in students with disabilities and socioeconomic status, as well as um, when comparing the, the various ethnicities. And you can see what the percentages are and, and where the biggest gaps are um, based on this graph. But in um, kind of pursuit of full representation across all student groups, um, this word underrepresented has become much more common. So I just wanted to remind everyone before I get into a, a little bit of data share connected uh, to our early college ecosystem, what underrepresented means. So in statute, we define it as any student group that holds a smaller percentage in a program as compared to the overall population. And so in a perfect world, we would see full representation in English learners by um, this left-hand English learner bar would be the same achievement or the same participation level in early college coursework as the non-English learners. And we would see that across all student groups if we had full representation. Underrepresented references the student groups that have less than full representation within those ecosystems. And so when we look at trends over the last um, five years, within uh, early college coursework for um, comparing socioeconomic status, uh, learning English and eligible for SPED services, we see a pretty flat line. Um, what we would love to see is a couple of things. We would love to see um, these lines going up more steeply, showing that there's higher percentages of students engaging in coursework. And you can see a slight bump in 2018 to 2019 uh, when this kind of initiative began. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, um, things have, have kind of flatlined and in some cases even went down a little bit within these, these spaces. But the hope is not only that these lines would be going up, but, but again, ultimately full representation would mean that all these lines were on top of one another, that there was no difference between a student learning English and um, all other students with regards to their participation in early college coursework. So- Can I have, Oh, go ahead, uh, What Inserting one thing, we have focused so much on math and in higher ed, we have co-requisite models and all kinds of models to promote math. But it was pointed out to me a week or so ago by someone in, at our general education task force that we should also be focusing on English. English 1010 is the number one enrolling concurrent enrollment course in our system. Do we have students that really need English 1015, which is kind of like an English on the steroids? This just came up in the CE director's conversation. And uh, I know two of our institutions do have something where they're, they're trying to work with English, Eng students learning English. And so that's why I, it was nice to see a little bit of a jump up in the goldenrod line. Yeah, so um, these, the, uh, many of you, maybe everyone on the call has seen these graphs before. Uh, are we I'm curious, but it looks like Nathan added that um, 
URL to the chat box so that on Monday you guys are able to see that information listed on our website. Awesome. And Ethan, I think that was 90 seconds. <laughs> Thanks so much, Christy. I appreciate it. Um, it. Yeah, if anyone has any questions about uh, how Utah Prime is set up, feel free to shoot um, emails either my or Christy's way. Um, Christy's the, the lead on that program. Um, she partners with CTE, and so uh, they can get you uh, help with how to um, to navigate applying for the pilot and, and what <laughs> that program might turn into uh, eventually if the pilot is successful. Um, so in the last 30 seconds, I will just talk about some things that are coming up. Uh, we have an early college dashboard, uh, as Brandon mentioned earlier, that's going to hopefully make visualizing this data and understanding the gaps that you have within your community much easier. There'll be uh, an AP and IB and a CE tab. There'll be both a public ed facing side and uh, a UCI institution or a higher ed facing side. So you can filter by service area uh, at the higher ed side or by your LEA uh, at the public side. And it'll help um, kind of fuel some conversations surrounding how to, to start closing these gaps. We'll be looking at early college success criteria and awarding those that are um, having uh, success within closing these gaps and growing their programs um, across the state in the coming months and years. Uh, and using those success criteria as guardrails for those that uh, are not being able to, to close gaps. And, and, and that conversation surrounding promising practice will finally be um, moving towards uh, having a quantitative element. So not only will it just be like, here's what I think works, but we'll have some data connected to what we're seeing is actually working on the ground. Um, and uh, I think because it's 1131, we'll just call it there. Um, so thanks so much for um, all the questions. I see there's a few questions and comments in the chat. Um, I'll get to them shortly. I have to jump over to another meeting now, but um, I, I look forward to get, continuing to get to collaborate and ch chat with everyone uh, at this afternoon session. Sorry to go one, one minute over, Brandon. Awesome. Well, thanks, uh, Nathan and Sid. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to share some of these updates with us. So we'll go ahead and adjourn. Just a reminder, um, if, you, uh, if you haven't yet, here, I'm going to post this link. Uh, to fill out the form to uh, indicate your uh, your email name and then whether you're with higher ed or public ed so we can set up those breakout sessions and uh, and until then we will uh, see you all at uh, at 1:30 so thanks everybody we'll see you soon